Hey guys, we're doing another build today. Today, and I hinted about this in my last build video, we're doing a build of a 4K video editing station. Now, this build is going to be for my father, and he's been working on the same machine in uh, Magix Vegas Pro for the last five years now, and it's really time for an upgrade. So, he really decided to go for an upgrade, because we're building a Threadripper. Now, initially, I didn't configure a Threadripper system for him. I went with a 2700X, because currently he has an i5 of about four to five years old. And I thought going from four cores without hyper-threading to six, uh, eight cores with hyper-threading, so 16 logical cores, would already be a very big upgrade. But he's also changing his footage from 1080p to 4K, so, well, he was going to need those extra cores. But then he asked me the question, are you sure there's nothing faster? I was like, well, of course there's something faster, but for the price, this is the best. Well, how much does faster cost? And in the end, he was like, I'm going to use this system for four to five years again. So spending another 700 to 1000 euros is worth it to me if I can get more performance in that time. And well, this is a Threadripper 1950X. So we go from four cores, which he has now without hyper-training, to 16 cores with hyper-training. So 32 logical threads. Now. I mentioned to this to him also. I'm not sure how Magix Vegas is going to react to that right now, but it's bound to be better than what he has, and it can only get better with future builds and software that gets up upgraded for multi-threading, etc. Now, you can already set 32 render threads in Magix Vegas Pro, but we'll uh, take a look, and probably in the second part of this video, or in the second video, actually, uh, what kind of effect that has against my 8-core Ryzen uh, running at 4 GHz. So, enough about that. That's basically the reason why I'm building this. Um, let's look at the components, and then I'll have a little time-lapse again. And as I said, I'm probably going to make this a two-parter, where I also show some benchmarks and other stuff in the second part. So, join along, and uh, let's discuss these components first. For the motherboard, I've chosen the ASUS ROG Strix X399-E. This motherboard comes in an E-ATX form factor, so it's a bit bigger than normal. This board has upgraded VRM cooling versus the Prime Pro and comes with everything you need, including a good Intel NIC, good onboard sound, and two M.2 slots with full 4X PCIe 3.0 lane bandwidth. All in all, a solid motherboard. For Ryzen builds, I like picking ASUS boards, because in my experience, they've done the most work in optimizing their BIOSes for different memory kits. The choice for the CPU was already obvious. An AMD Threadripper 1950X, which has 16 cores running at a base frequency of 3.4 GHz. And given enough thermal headroom, it'll boost up to 4.1, giving you excellent performance. To try and cool this monster of an 180 watt stock TDP CPU, I chose the Noctua NHU 14S TR4 edition. I am hoping this can provide enough cooling so that the processor can use its turbo all the time, but also has enough cooling performance to survive long render sessions. I didn't go with water cooling in this build, because this build is more silence focused than overclocking. To continue that trend and trying to make this build as silent as possible, I'm replacing all the stock fans with the newest Noctua NF-A12X25PWM models. Yes, it's a lot of money for fans, but these fans won't die on you and should provide the most silent cooling you can get. As some of you might have started noticing, I'm kind of a Seasonic fan. So I picked up a Prime Platinum 750 watt. That is more than plenty of power for this build, 
but it keeps some in reserve for future upgrades, like a Threadripper 2 or maybe a beefier video card. In the meantime, it means the power supply will mostly run in passive mode, further contributing to a silent build. Next up, we're going to need some storage. We didn't spare any expense here, and we went with a Samsung 970 EVO 512GB as a boot and program SSD, and with a, again, Samsung 970 EVO 1TB as a video scratch drive. Ongoing projects will be kept on there, making sure that while editing, the storage won't cause any slowdowns. The Threadripper CPU has enough PCIe lanes to be able to run both of these SSDs at their full PCIe X4 speeds. Next to the SSDs, we also need some mass storage. So I added 2 times 10 terabyte Seagate Ironwolf drives in a mirror configuration, which should be plenty for the next coming years. The mirror setup in the old computer saved my dad's data multiple times, so we're doing the same again in this one. And then a component I haven't used in a long while, a optical burner. This is a Blu-ray burner which can burn up to 100 gigabyte Blu-ray discs. And my dad still wants to read and sometimes write optical media. So I chose a USB drive so he can keep it in the closet while he doesn't need it. And he can get it out when he does occasionally sometimes write an optical disc. That way, it can also move to newer computers or other computers in the house. And, well, should be good. And to keep things legal, we have an official Windows 10 home license. Can't forget that. For the case, we're going to use a fractal design to find R6. A very sturdily built case, sound dampened on all sides, while still providing good and decent airflow. No windows, no RGB, just a well-designed and sturdily built silent black box. For the memory, we've chosen a G-Scale RGB kit we still had lying around from a different build. It's a 32GB 3000MHz kit with 4 modules, so it should be perfectly suited for the quad channel of the Threadripper CPU. And last up we have the video card. Temporarily, we're going to use a GTX 1050 with 2GB of memory, because his current video card is a GTX 1060 with 6GB of memory and once I bring the build to him, we'll transplant that video card. Now, the newest build of Magic Vegas Pro can even use hardware rendering to HEVC, H.265 encoding, so the GTX 1060 6GB is a great match. And that's it. That's most of the hardware that's going in there. So let's look at the time lapse. If you want to skip, and uh, see my end remarks and the build, you can check the description for time codes. And otherwise, I'll see you at the other end and enjoy the music.
unbridled, creative imagination began to begin with a new art form.
Well, the build went well. And after building, I did change a few little things, like I changed around the fan connections to what you see in the video. In the video, I used the opt fan connector for the back fan. And you can't really regulate that port because it will always be in sync with the CPU fan header. And there's an, a different pump header where normally the back fan header is. So I had to use the extension cable that comes with the Noctua fans to go to the bottom of the board. No big problem there. Talking about fans, keeping this Threadripper cool was actually a, quite a big challenge. I kept running into that during stress tests, the uh, Noctua heatsink couldn't keep up after a while. So I added another fan on the heatsink and the hardware to do that, except for the fan, is included with the heatsink, so that was easy. And uh, I lowered the voltage going to the Threadripper with an off minus offset of 0 0.075 volts. And that made sure that the temperature stayed in check, even if I did a temperature test of like five or six hours or a Prime 95 test or a Vegas rendering test, etc. Now, I'm not going to discuss any benchmark results in this video. We'll take a closer look at that in a separate video after this. But if I had to build this again, I would have probably choose one of those Lictec 360mm all-in-ones, because then I would also have some more overclocking potential, which you're not going to have with this air-cooled Noctua build. It's silent during normal operation, but once the CPU has to work, you're definitely going to hear it. Now it's knock, knock to a whoosh sound, so it's not too bad, but still, it could have been uh, maybe not quieter, but it could have been overclocked at least. Still, not the focus of this build, so in the end, I'm quite happy with it. In the end, some RGB did manage to get into the build because of the motherboard and the memory. Motherboards just come with RGB these days, and the memory kit is something we had lying around, and 32 gigabytes of DDR4 memory easily costs you 300 or uh, 400 euros almost. So we reuse this kit and with the lid on the case, you basically can't see it. But the kit is running running on cast latency 16 at 3066 megahertz. And that's good in my book. Peripheral wise, we finished off with a Logitech G413 in silver because it has white backlights and a MX Master 2S mouse. Both of these worked very well and felt great to the touch, so they were a big upgrade to what my father had before. And although it's a gamer keyboard, this keyboard's actually quite spartan and fits well in an office environment. Well, that's it for this part. I hope you enjoyed another video, and let me know in the comments what you thought about the build. I'll be doing a second video with some benchmarks and some performance insights to how Threadripper performs with or within Magic's Vegas Pro. So keep tuned for that and uh, I'll hopefully see you next time. Bye bye.